Hey guys, welcome to the Leadership to Wealth podcast. Uh, today, we really do have a special treat for you. I want to really preface this because I get really giddy in our episode today because I, as a real estate investor, and for those of you that are interested in real estate, you're going to really love our guest. You know, I want to read something to you from the network that he is CEO of. And it says, you want to find areas where the population is growing faster than the provincial average and that are gaining a reputation as a great place to live. This was written back in 2005 and fundamentals that that he and his network have talked about for more than two and a half decades are still fundamentals for real estate investing today. We talk about what it is and what to look for, as well as leadership how to find mentors, how to find the right leaders, how to find great real estate, and how to build your financial dreams with real estate investing. Today's guest, CEO of The Rain Network, Patrick Francie. Patrick, thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Look forward to it. Thanks for the introduction. It's great. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, just to be clear, you, you know, I'm especially tickled because when I started my own real estate journey, you know, back back in the day, there, we didn't even I didn't even know I was out on the East Coast and that and I didn't even know where you could get real estate information. The first book I ever read was Rich Dad Poor Dad, yeah. and and that, and I was like, well, where do I find information? And the second book I read was Real Estate Investing in Canada by Don Campbell, yeah. um, of course, a former uh, former CEO. And um, I, I'm, I believe, good friend of yours still to this day. Yeah, I know Don well, you bet. Yes, yes. And, um, and so, you know, it's, and that, that book, it's funny, there are, you know, the basics that you teach, that you guys teach in RAIN, there are things there that I still will share with people today as a philosophy when it comes to understanding real estate. And so, you know, guys, if you're if you're new into real estate, you want to get into real estate, you you want to get into real estate investing and you're trying to figure out that or you're you're trying to figure out where the next step is strap yourself in this conversation is going to lead you into a lot of great areas um, because uh, Patrick has made it really, I, I would say, Patrick, and you can comment on this. You've really made it your life to be authentic about this, to really be a leader in this space and to, uh, in your words, to be a contribution to people in, in their life journey. Yeah, you bet. I mean, I've been part of the RAIN community for over 20 years, 20, uh, 22 years, I think it is to be exact. And, uh, you know, RAIN's been around for 30 years teaching real estate investors how to create a financial future investing in real estate. You know, my own journey, you know, back 20 years ago as a business owner was to say, well, you know, how do I plan for my future? And I came across a uh, little different way of uh, coming across RAIN, but I came across the Real Estate Investment Network and started to understand what it meant to invest in real estate, you know, invest versus, let's say, speculate or, you know, throw money up against the wall and hope it sticks. So, uh, you know, over the past 20 years, I built my own real estate portfolio, my wife and I, and, uh, you know, came on to work with Don R. Campbell, the, the author of that book, uh, in uh, Real Estate Investing in Canada that you spoke of. And uh, I came to work with him and then ended up buying the business in 2014 and went on to then, you know, that's the entrepreneurial spirit in me. And, and it all worked out the way it all worked out. And, you know, here I am today and still being a, trying to be a contribution. And to your point, you know, be just telling the truth, authentic, you know, we don't sell real estate. We just educate and do research. So that's, that's, that's right. the game we play. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's one of the interesting things and perhaps one of the unique things about the rain network is that you do not sell real estate, but really it's about that network and bringing people together to be able to uh, be professionals in the space uh, as investors. Yeah. I mean, I think that with anybody, when you go on an adventure where 
uh, you're trying to be successful in, in creating that kind of financial base. You're tying up capital. You're learning how to even raise capital, how to do deals. When you bring yourself together in a community of like-minded individuals that are sharing their own experiences, their mistakes, their wins, uh, their losses, because that also does happen if people aren't following the system that we teach, for example. But ultimately, when you put yourself into a community of like-minded individuals, and, and we've really created a culture that is of collaboration and of support. So, you know, nobody's hiding, you know, holding their co their cards, hold uh, close to their chest, not sharing. They're actually going here. This is what I've learned. Don't, you know, don't, you don't have to go down that big, long path. Here's a quicker way to get to where I was. You know, I've learned all those lessons. Let me share it with you. So it's really collaborative in the terms of the community. And, and that's based on the culture that we've created over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because for me, I, I remember it like it was yesterday and I was trying to get into this and I, and I was like, where do I get this information? And I remember that book was the first book that started breaking down how to look at the basics of real estate investing, not just the motivation, the excitement, the inspiration behind it. It started giving me some, some actual technical skills. The first one I, I always remember was it talked about that, uh, you know, real estate is not, there is no such thing as a national uh, real estate market. It's uh, regional and uh, and local and being yeah. able to go, okay, you've got to look into that. Oh, yeah. that's great. Well, where can I find people that can help me learn that? And I remember talking to some people and the, they said, well, I don't know, I've got a couple of buddies and this is what we do. And I said, great, where did you meet them? And they said, well, they're my neighbors. Uh, and I thought, okay, great. I don't know where to go. And I thought, let me look into rain. And I would have to fly at that time uh, to Toronto to try to attend one of the events. Yeah. And uh, for young kids, I was like, I don't know how to do this. And it was very cost prohibitive at the time. Now, you guys have done some revolutionary things uh, through through the pandemic. Perhaps not that revolutionary because there's been a huge movement to to online. But you guys have really moved the network forward by by going online and being able to uh, to teach and have that online. Can you can you talk to what you guys are doing now in that space? Sure. I mean, when when we when the lockdown happened, we actually did our last big uh, kind of big event, what we would call, you know, our, our big educational event in Calgary on March the 7th, 2020. You know, that was yeah. our what we call at the time our acre event, it was our primary yes. educational weekend. You know, there's yes. I don't know, 450 people at that event. And then literally we were starting to get, we'd already written the report on COVID. So we knew something was coming. We didn't know to what degree and that it would yes. be a total, you know, global lockdown, but we'd actually yes. issued and done a report on COVID uh, in December of 2019. So we were aware that things were unfolding and things were happening, like I say, never to the scale and or within the scope of all of this. But ultimately, we all flew home. And the next thing you know, March 15th, everything's locked down. And what was really unique about Rain at the time was I have an international team. So we are literally, we have team internationally. Then, you know, some of my key uh, management team are in Ontario. They're in another part of British Columbia. So we were already very, very familiar with Zoom. That's how we communicated. We were already you know, set up to do various things. So the point of that, I guess, is that when the lockdown happened, we literally just went live into the world that we already existed in, which was a virtual world, and really drove that initiative. Because through all of that, one of the things that we understand from a community point of view is they needed leadership. And we were really prepared and wanted to provide that. We were very intentional about going people need leadership through this time it's confusing it's frightening it's concerning oh my gosh you know am i ever going to go back to work is my business shut down i mean i had businesses shut down in alberta i had retail businesses that i had to close the stores and you know so there was a lot of stuff moving so we got online right away and started really stepping into that role of leadership that we could provide based on the fact that we do so much economic research. So then what we also know, and this is a little bit of uh, 
you know, old guy wisdom is that I've been through many, many real estate cycles. I've been through many recessions over the years, big recessions. I'm old enough to have done that. So I understand that through any, uh, like any times there's chaos like this, in it lives opportunity. Now we said right out of the gate, you know, folks, I don't know what the opportunity is going to look like. I just know there's going to be a lot of opportunity start to unfold. So prepare mentally, financially uh, for that. And, and we just took steps. And as the weeks and months, you know, started to unfold, we could see a lot more clear what was happening economically, what that would mean to the housing market and to real estate and where some investment opportunities will live. And we were pretty good. And, so, you know, mostly we we're great. Uh, I think we called some shots a little bit early, but, you know, so we expected things to happen a little sooner than they did, but ultimately they happened. Yeah, that's right. Um, it, it's, it is interesting. You you mentioned about real estate cycles and we can get to that in a little bit. A lot of people, uh, they know me as uh, an expert in the space of private lending, uh, private uh, mortgage investments and, it's something that I that I uh, went into again off of real estate investing, and one of the things that we I remember when COVID hit was everyone was like, "What do we do now? And what's going to happen?" And you you're right in that nobody could have told you exactly what was going to happen, but you understand that there are real estate cycles, and the great thing about real estate that I think everyone understands with it being around <laughs> investing in it for thousands and thousands of years is that all of these things will pass and this is just another cycle it may be caused by something that we don't fully understand but uh in the long run will be okay so can you say something to because i, I know you deal with this a lot can you say something to perhaps the mindset of the early investor and and what it was for you that changed to go from being a business owner to saying hey i want to i i'm getting something different about real estate yeah sure i mean the most you know early on like early investors even first time home buyers right now and historically you know investors are very very influenced by headlines you know yes. so you know the most i think the most basic insights I can encourage people to understand is that headlines, especially more than ever, I wouldn't say especially today, they've always been that way. But today, more than ever, because of technology, because of the ability, you know, very few people have a newspaper in their hand anymore. It's all read online. But at the end of the day, we used to have newspapers that were there to deliver news. That was the whole point of it. But understand one fundamental purpose of newspapers is to sell advertising. So then they started getting headlines and creating headlines that would actually, you know, click. We use the term clickbait. And even in our most, you know, in our biggest uh, newspapers uh, these days, there's a lot of clickbait. There's a lot of headlines that they need to use to in order for people to open up those particular articles. At the end of the day, human nature, it's bad news, bad news, bad news. And we've got all this information coming at us that it seems like, Oh my gosh, how are we even going to survive this? So we've oh, we used to use the term what's behind the curtain and where we literally looked at what's behind the headline so that you start to understand that the headline is just a headline. You need to dig deeper into it. So, you know, at this point, in the past couple of years, I've literally not been using any newspaper articles as my source of information. I just go to the data because I just don't trust that source of information. Again, it's uh, often lagging. It's often just, I'm gonna use the term clickbait. That's just how I see it these days. I just go to the data. We have a research team that looks at the numbers. So the point of it is this, is that mentally you will get hammered and beat up. You'll get more confused. You'll probably gain, you'll get some anxiety around it. Uh, and you just won't have the confidence to move forward because the headlines are going, the world's coming to an end. There's a real estate bubble. Prices are going to drop 40%. Interest rates are going to go to 18%. You know, there's so many headlines all coming from different sources. And by the way, they seem to be coming from trusted sources, whether it be BMO or CMHC or some other bank or some other economist. And because I follow many economists, I can tell you that few of them ever align on what they're forecast is. And of course, the joke with economists is, you know, what do we know about a forecast? 
it's wrong. Secondly, what do we know about a forecast? We're going to have to change it. So if you don't know that, if you don't understand at least conceptually how that all works, it can really throw you off your game. So what happens is you sit on the sidelines and you wait. And then the next thing you know, a year passes or several years pass and you go, why the hell didn't I invest in real estate years ago? Well, because you got thrown off because of whatever headlines you were reading, whatever bad news that you took on. And, you know, at the end of the day, you just have to look at the data and understand the system of how to invest in real estate. And it'll give you the confidence to move forward. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's that's really interesting because a lot of new investors really wonder to themselves, can I actually understand this stuff? Y you know, I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to I'm going to lose money with all of the headlines, with all of the the news that's out there. That's really the rea the reality is that fear creates more of a reaction oftentimes than good news. And so it's always out there and people are inundated with it. And so people have a tendency, even if they're interested in it, they're, they have a tendency to hold back like you you pointed out. How, how do people navigate that? Uh, you know, obviously you can put it aside, but then how can they start to trust the information and trust themselves that, that what they're doing is, uh, is right or, you know, that they're moving in the right direction? Well, there's a there's a quote that I often use. I can't tell you who said it. I've I used it for years. I don't know where it came from. Uh, it's not mine. But the quote is that confidence is rarely owned. It's almost always borrowed. And understanding that confidence is gained by getting past the fear through different methodologies, right? You're going to borrow confidence by somebody or from somebody who has gone before you. You're going to gain confidence again, you know, the rain community by a community of like minded individuals who are doing it. And then, of course, understanding that it is education. You know, people, you know, it's education and understanding that there is a system. We teach a 15 step system to successfully investing in real estate. And you have to want to understand that system. It's not complicated. It's very pragmatic. It's very doable. We like 180,000 investors have gone through our programs over the years and have done so quite successfully. Now, the point is, is that around the system, and here's the thing about it that I often use this particular analogy. You know, if you're wanting to find gold or diamonds or precious metals of some sort, you have to dig, you have to actually excavate, you have to look. And it's not like you walk down the beach picking up gold and silver and, you know, diamonds. You have to dig for it. You have to work for it is my point. And real estate's no different. You have the possibility of making tens of or hundreds of or even millions of dollars. And it takes some work. It takes some effort. And you have to be methodical. You have to be pragmatic. You have to really pay attention to it. But that getting through that fear, I don't think it ever goes away, to be honest with you. There's always a degree of that. Is it some discomfort anyways? But when you gain confidence from others who have gone before you, you can actually see that it's being done. You know, I use a phrase as well that, you know, you don't see opportunity until you think it's possible. When you put yourself in a community or in a position where those around you are doing it, you go, oh, gee, guess what? It's possible, you know, and then you start to see the opportunity and then you start to take and, you know, take those steps forward. What I just really heard there, and, you know, I hope the listeners are catching into this is there's there's lots of nice things you'll hear out there but if when you catch that possibility it creates an opening for you to go down you know to go down and learn all these different aspects and it it really is the beginning and you know i think for me the beginning was reading rich dad poor dad and it was it it just opened up this possibility of wait you mean I can own real estate? Mm -hmm. How did that never really cross my mind, you know, through the different circumstances that you go through? And so that's really powerful. And I'm I'm definitely going to steal that quote about uh, confidence. Um, yeah. 
We do. <laughs> Rarely owned. <laughs> that that is. I think there's a there's a, cu- a couple things that I want to you know don't want to step over. You know the yes the book Rich Dad Poor Dad is probably one of the most read books. You know if I'm talking to my guests on the Everyday Millionaire podcast, you know when I'm asking them what was the most influential book, many of them are adding you know or are are often saying that Rich Dad Poor Dad was a very influential book. But aside from the fact that the book talks about real estate, understand that. We're trying to create wealth, long-term, sustainable wealth. And we have to connect it to more than just money. And in the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you start to understand that if you're just working for a paycheck, uh, you're not ever going to save yourself to being wealthy. And what real estate is, is a vehicle to do that, that's proven, that is, you know, again, uh, systematic in its approach. It's not gambling. If you follow a system. It is not speculating if you follow a system. It's very methodical. And as you know, as a, a as a, a lender, you know, private capital, uh, you start to look at real estate and what you really see is the opportunity. And when you're looking at a deal, you're looking at the numbers, you're looking at the performer, you're starting to understand what the potential for that property is that gives you some confidence in actually uh, dispersing that capital. So the point of it all is, is that we have this vision of a future that it requires us to do more than just collect a paycheck for those who have jobs. And we get shut down by the headlines that say, you know, millennials will never own a home. You know, I just did a podcast with Derek Lobo who wrote a book, you know, the self-funding house, which was specifically for millennials, young people to actually own a home and to do it in a way that makes sense because it's not rocket science for us who are involved in it. We understand that if you're gonna buy a proper, if you're gonna buy your first home in this day and age, make it an investment property. It's really simple in terms of concept concept anyways. And that is, is that you buy a house and you get a duplex, you up down suite, for example, and you rent it out. You get some rents, you have a roommate or two or three. Uh, I've, I've seen this done more times than I can count. And I've actually talked to RAIN members, young men in this case, uh, but it doesn't matter, uh, that uh, bought a property, bought a bungalow, put a basement suite in it. They live downstairs and they rent out the rest of the place. So they've got four buddies. They're young. They, they, they're having fun with it. They charge a rent and they live there literally for free. One of them cash flows 200 bucks a month. So he's literally living in his house and he's getting paid 200 bucks a month to live there. Not a bad deal. <laughs> and not a bad deal at all. One of my best friends, Alan, he, uh, it was really interesting because he bought a house and, and he rented out one of the rooms when he was younger and rented out one of the rooms, rented out the other room, rented out. Now he doesn't have a room. He starts, uh, he starts sleeping in the basement on, on a uh, blow up mattress. Then he decides to renovate the basement rents it out he actually started sleeping in a closet for a little bit (laughs) (laughs) well listen at the end of the day you know something this is you know we all remember our youth i certainly remember my youth and when i was 18 years old i was living on my own and i had a couple of roommates and you know that's the time that you want to do it you're more flexible you are not burdened by so many things in terms of responsibilities. Yes, you got to go to work and do all the things that you do. But ultimately, that's the time to start on these kinds of journeys. And it's, you know, really in this day and age, everybody's talking about side hustles and how to hack and how to do all the things that we do. If you want to hack future wealth, get a couple roommates when you buy a house and uh, own the home on your own, but rent it to some friends and have some roommates. It's a great hack. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. And and that is a great point in terms of understanding sort of where you're at in, in your life. Because one of the things that was present for me was I've got four kids. I got a wife. I've got four kids. I was involved with my church community. I was involved yeah. in, in different aspects. And I was starting to build my real estate portfolio. And it it's kind of how I got into private lending was realizing that I I didn't have some of the time available to do uh, to do the the stuff with real estate investing and I hadn't built up the systems to be able to to uh, give it 
to give it the amount of time that I had available. And so I got into private lending. And one of the things that I found with that is we're able to leverage, right? Mm -hmm. Because now people who have properties, hey, you're in a different area of your life. You're in a different section. Maybe there, there's something a little bit more hands-off for you, which is why some of us who still want to be in real estate will navigate back and forth. And mm -hmm. I think there's something in, in what you're saying there for people to recognize where are you in your life journey and how can you bring real estate in? You, you may not be able to jump in like, uh, say, Grant Cardone and do these things. You may not be in a position to live out of the backseat of your car, but there is a way to build a system. This is what you guys teach to build a system for where you are in your life to be able to uh, start to create wealth on financially. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's a, a couple parts to it, right? So in, in the education that we provide, it is a 15 step system, understanding the economic fundamentals, you know, from a real estate point of view, we want to invest in real estate with a future, not just with a past. So in other words, when we look at the economic fundamentals of a country, of a province, of a city, we start to realize that there are definitely economic fundamentals that pre-position or give us a future picture of where real estate will go based on what's happening economically. So for example, we know when there's positive GDP growth, we know that means that there's a lot of jobs. When there's a lot of jobs, we know that people are working and that there's going to be in migration or immigration into that region because people want to work. We're seeing that happen right now, for example, in the Western provinces in Alberta, we're having more people leave Ontario, for example, uh, and head to Alberta or even the East Coast. And why is that? Well, the cost of living in Ontario, although there seems to be lots of jobs, the cost of living is very high. The cost of housing is very high. Whereas you get into Alberta, cost of housing is low, cost of living is low. You don't have uh, you know, an HST. And uh, at the end of the day, Alberta has lots of jobs that are actually quite high paying and rents are less expensive. So immigration, like immigrants coming into the country, which we have a lot of them, and then you've got interprovincial migration. So residents moving out of one province into another. I use Ontario as one of the primary suppliers of Alberta population these days. But ultimately, my point is this, is when people move into that region, they want to buy a, or they'll rent a home. They don't start by buying. They start by renting. Over a period of a couple of years, they start to buy. And that really gives you a look at what the future of real estate is going to be, because as demand increases for buying as people come out of the rental market, then of course prices increase. So that's all to say this is that it's a very systematic approach. Uh, you know, there's influencers along the way. COVID was an influencer. And this is what really freaks people out is that they think COVID is forever. Well, it's not. It's three years later. We went through some chaos. We, you know, had the bubble that we had, you know, in terms of housing and it was FOMO and it was you know, really peaked in, uh, you know, whatever, March-ish of 2022, and then everything started to come off the rails. But that wasn't for everywhere. That was primarily Southern Ontario, not so much in BC, although some in BC for sure, uh, different markets. And then Alberta, uh, Calgary or Edmonton didn't feel any effects. As a matter of fact, Calgary went up in price at the same time. So that goes back to the regional part, understanding what's driving uh, a region economically, and then you start to see these things happening. Yeah. It, it one of the things that happened was for people like myself, it drove us into buying into our other provinces where you watched Ontario was just going uh, <laughs> vertical and it, it drove yeah. us to other areas. And I saw a lot of people that would uh, buy sight unseen were buying properties in other locations and yeah. without any fundamentals there. Mm -hmm. Oh, this property. Oh, oh, that's really cheap. And they would buy that. Let me ask a bit of a technical question, uh, which you may or may not want to get into. And this is about out West. And this is for myself. I'm really curious because I, I'm a little concerned about what's happening out West because of some of the influences I'm watching sort of this, this uh, battle on a political scale with regards to, you know, with regards to uh, fuel, gas and and that uh, along with farming. And I'm seeing a lot of pressures from our federal government that's coming out um, 
on Western Canada. And I'm concerned about what those kind of impacts are. And we're seeing Alberta standing up sort of as a beacon, I've got to say, mm. as a beacon in mm. the country to some of these forces. Can you can you comment at all about what you're <laughs> thinking of out there? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know where, where you see it, but I'm, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, it almost looks like we're going to see a standoff between the federal and provincial governments. And, and I'm not understanding uh, how that's going to play out. Um, so let's I'm, play it. Let's excited, talk about it. But, yep, I'm happy yeah. to talk about it. I, yeah. I, I, all I can do is give you my view of it and understanding yes. that, you know, we as investors, and it doesn't matter whether it's real estate or, or Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, yeah. whatever, precious metals, you know, uh, REITs, I don't care what it is. We have to develop a thesis. We have to look at the possibilities and then determine the probabilities. So when we look at what's happening in real estate, as I said earlier, we look at the economic fundamentals, you know, GDP growth, employment growth, immigration, uh, you know, population growth. Those are all fundamentals that drive real estate, which we know in Alberta is very strong. There are influencers. I gave the example of COVID as an influencer, but th that's what it is. It's an influencer. Now, influencers are shorter term, not that they're really short term, but they are uh, sometimes in weeks or months, sometimes years, but they're influencers. They're not an economic, they're not a fundamental. So another example of that is interest rates. Interest rates are an influencer. They go up, they go down. We see what's happened with interest rates as an influencer. Uh, that particular influencer called interest rates was for a long period of time. All of a sudden it spiked. Will they come back down? Probably at some point. But we know the next year or two, we're going to be higher rates than we were when we were like 1% or half a percent or whatever other deals that were out there. So a little bit long winded, but then we get into politics, another influencer. Yeah. So right now we've got our federal government, Trudeau's going into eight years or whatever it's been. You know, he's proving time and time again his incompetence. And that's just me. That's my political view. I have no problem sharing that. And the point is, is that you've got uh, the premier of Alberta, Daniel Smith's going, no, we're done. Enough of this. We are uh, an epic supplier of what Canada needs. Canada needs oil. We need to export oil. Other countries need to export it. You know, you've got a federal government that's on this green train, which I'm not against the environmental uh, thought processes. But at the end of the day, we can be commodity providers. And I mean, even beyond oil. And we can do it environmentally safe. So what is that all to say? It's to say that, yes, federally and provincially, they're going to go neck to neck, head to head, toe to toe. They're supposed to be having a meeting, meet one on one, all of the rest of the political stories that go on there. From a, a economic point of view, number one, I think Trudeau's likely to, if he doesn't get voted out, he would be really a minority government again going into an, an, the the next kind of cycle uh yeah. political cycle 2025 yeah. when we look at what's happening economically really tough to shut alberta down given what's happening with the different agreements geopolitically on a macro level so for example china saudi arabia have inked a deal uh, we know russia ukraine that war is not going away anytime soon as a matter of fact it could escalate so what does that mean it means that oil is going to continue to be in short supply. We're going to see yes. oil prices probably start to rise. Right now, they're pretty, they're relatively low, 80 bucks. I haven't looked today. I don't even know what the number is. But uh, at the end of the day, you're going to see probably oil go well over $100. I think you'll see that by the end of 2023. All of that is to say that Alberta is still positioned strong. Will there be some political influencers that in the short term may impact Alberta economically? Yeah, maybe. Uh, will it impact real estate? Unless people start moving out of the province, we still have a supply and demand. You know, as long as the demand there, which I think it will continue to be, there'll be supply. As long as people are working, they will figure out how to make things happen financially. And so that's a bit of a long winded. I want to give you lots of context for it's not just as simple as, you know, I'm worried about Alberta. You have to create a thesis around it. So that's just kind of an overview of my thesis. I could get into far more detail, but ultimately uh, that's why I'm not as concerned. I love the fact that Danielle Smith is pushing back against Trudeau. And I think it's necessary to take a stand for your province, uh, which has not been the norm. And so, yeah, that's where we're at today. I think if anything, yeah. they'll go through some short-term pain, 
but ultimately it'll come out the other side and we'll be stronger for it. Yeah. I, I, I've never really commented on, or I, I stay away from the political arena by and sure. large, they're going to come up and come down. This, this time is interesting for me because I'm seeing the effects on other people. I'm seeing mm -hmm. how it's playing out on them. And for the first time, you know, over history, I'm old enough. I got enough gray hairs. Uh, you know, we we share some of those, and and I'm watching what feels like. I, I'm not going down the conspiracy uh, hole here, but what feels like a coordinated effort. And I'm just watching and going, why are we putting so much pressure on you know these rare earth materials that are coming out of ground that saved us during COVID? You know, when when Russia couldn't produce these natural fertilizers. We're putting all of these different uh, mm -hmm. bans on uh, the ability to farm and and then, of course, oil and gas. And I'm just looking at that turmoil that it's creating out there, never mind all, all the other political things. And I'm, and I'm wondering, what is the long-term impact? I think that people can, obviously, some people will be able to weather the storm in light of what we've just gone through, where there was sort of a buying frenzy, it, it was something that was definitely on my mind because people have asked me, would I lend money out West? And I thought, I don't know. It, it creates a different set of, um, a, a different set of risk that I can't quite measure at this point in time. And so I said, uh, I think I'll stay to the markets that I know on the East. Um, mm -hmm. But selfishly, I wanted to ask to, to get your opinion, and I, I yeah, I'm, your, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very, view. I'm very, I am very bullish on Alberta overall. Um, yeah. You know, Calgary continues to lead the way. Edmonton generally follows. Eighteen months later, uh, historically, yeah. we'll do that. You know, I've been, I've born, and raised in Edmonton, so I know Alberta yeah. exceptionally well, and I understand kind of the culture and the. Uh, the real estate market out there and how things flow. You know, one of the things that you'd mentioned a while ago in the interview, you'd made a comment about a bunch of money flowing into Alberta, you know, sight unseen. And, and there's a fundamental, you know, throwing money up against the wall to see what sticks. You know, when we look at real estate, we have to understand that, for example, Toronto, GTA, Ontario overall, you know, culturally, British Columbia is that way, you know, Vancouver particularly, you know, densified uh, living, you know, as in condos are a popular thing for people to buy, to live in, yes, but also to invest in. In Alberta, you know, Ontario, you know, somebody from the GTA looks at a condo in Alberta for 350 grand and go, oh my gosh, it's almost free. I can buy three of them. Right. So the understanding is not there in terms of culturally uh, and understanding the economics of what is driving the condo market. Alberta is a risky move for condos. In, in Edmonton, I say flat out, if you're investing, do not invest in condos in Edmonton. That's just my opinion. I have many years of it. I own many condos and uh, I, can, I have a lot of experience in that market. Calgary, if you know exactly what you're doing and you have a great realtor, Condos may make sense if your intention is to exit within the first five years and you're buying a new condo. If you've got a long-term plan with Calgary buying a condo, you better be extra cautious and you better have a very, very good investor-focused realtor that understands that market and is going to stay on top of it. But arbitrarily investing into new build condos, I'm not on that side. I disagree with that philosophy in terms of it. Now, if you want to talk about single family detached duplex, uh, if you want to talk about fourplex or multifamily, sure, all day long, I'm all over it. But that's a, that's a cautionary comment I make to that particular market because yeah. culturally, uh, Albertans are not densified. They're wide open, blue sky, big open spaces, you know, and that's a lot of what people are looking for. Having said that, yeah. having said that, a lot of immigration coming in, they that's what they know. They know condos. So yeah. it's not, it's, it's, extra caution in the condo market as an example yeah that <laughs> that is a great point and i think it lends to what we were talking about earlier with regards to you can't just look at the national real estate market you got to look provincially mm -hmm. regionally you know and yeah. locally and yeah. understand the people that live there and a lot of people wonder why i like lending in mm -hmm. rural parts of uh, of different provinces 
when other people aren't interested in that. And, I, and I've always shared with them, it's a different mindset. And if you understand the mindset of the people that live in these places, then you're, you're not speculating. You're not having to worry and have sleepless nights like the people that bought pre-cons right now and are finding the value of them is less and they're trying to close on these properties well i think there's a just in just so we don't step over that because if you're you know if your listeners are trying to learn a little bit more about real estate understand that the whole pre-con game uh was a lot of speculation you know uneducated people coming in now a lot of money has been made in pre-construction and if you understand that market but when you're Buying a pre-construction with no intentions of ever closing, all you're going to do is assign it. Let's just use that model, popular model, particularly in Toronto. Guess what? You are taking a risk because at the end of the day, when the music stops and there's no chair, you're standing there with this pre-construction condo that you have to figure out how to close on. And that could be problematic because now you there's no one to assign it to because nobody wants to buy it because prices have dropped because they can't get financing because interest rates have gone up all sorts of reasons. The next thing you know, you've made these commitments to one, two, even three condos and uh, you have no way of unloading them. That puts you in a really tough financial position. So let me without committing you to this, because obviously we're not giving financial advice uh, in this conversation, but Mm -hmm. With 2023 and 2024 ahead of us, what would you say, what what kind of predictors would you give for, what type of predictions would you give for the real estate market in perhaps in different provinces and uh, perhaps even locally? Yeah, I think I'm not, I'm not a big fan of predictions. You know, if we were looking specifically at markets, there's a couple of things that we have to understand. First off, what's your strategy? You know, so we just talked about, you know, I'm going to buy pre-construction. I'm going to assign it before it's built. I'm going to you know, ride the appreciation curve and then I'll assign it to somebody next. OK, got it. That's not a great strategy, especially, you know, when you're at the peak of a market into at the peak of a boom cycle. You know, we're now into a slump cycle right across the country, different versions of a slump. Well, when I say slump cycle, most people go, oh, my gosh, it's like they're freaked out by it. Ultimately, though, sophisticated investors go, finally, we're into a slump cycle. Finally, I can get some deals done. Finally, there's some motivated vendors. You know, so we understand that a slump cycle or a recovery cycle are those perfect times for a cycle in terms of investing. But within that context, first off, you have to have a plan. You have to have a strategy. What tactic are you going to use? What's your exit strategy? You know, if I made mistakes early on, some of the biggest mistakes I think I made was I didn't have an exit strategy. So I've got real estate today that I don't mind that I own it, but I'm going, gosh, I, I, you know, it would have been better for me to sell that 10 years ago, you know, and that's, that's all in hindsight. And fortunately, my portfolio isn't made up a bunch of those properties. And those properties, by the way, are great. I mean, they're all but paid off. So it's not a strain. But the point is, is that, What I'm emphasizing there is that you actually have a a clear strategy. You know, as I said, if you're going to buy a condo in Calgary, I think you have to really consider it. And I wouldn't recommend holding that condo for more than three to five years, given what happens in that condo cycle of Alberta cities. Now, that's just me. Then there's the other side of it. Are you going to buy this property and hold it for years? Are you looking at saying, no, no, I'm going to do fix and flips and have you know, and generate income today. What am I doing? So that's the challenge around it. So I could make all sorts of predictions, but it doesn't really cover the gambit of what is the strategy, because that's what matters given what's happening in the market that you're looking at investing in. I am with you in the excitement of of these next couple of years. Obviously, I, mean, I can give you my view economically. I can tell you that yeah. I think that economically, I think the Western provinces has now, this cycle is where it is. I think they're going to continue to be strong because they've got the commodities, they've got agriculture, they're yeah. diversified their portfolio, they've got a far better uh, and lower cost of living. And although if you live in Alberta, Saskatchewan or Manitoba, you're going, oh, the cost of living is outrageous. And then if you move to British Columbia, you know, the province of bring cash, you start to realize just how inexpensive it is to live in those other provinces. And, you know, or if you live in Toronto, you start to, or if you compare to Toronto. So the point is this, 
is that I think that right now as we sit and it's hard to look a year or two down the road and simply because when you look at the geopolitical issues that are happening in the world, we don't know what's going to happen. And we're at the effect of all of those things. You know, uh, Bank of America, the CEO for the Bank of America just came out yesterday and is warning that he suspects that the U.S. will default on their debt. That's a big deal. You know, uh, their ceiling, uh, their debt ceiling, they've hit it. They've already been robbing a little bit of Peter to pay Paul. And now they're talking about default. Well, when the CEO of one of the biggest banks makes that kind of a statement publicly, uh, that's usually a pretty good flag, a pretty big warning. So having said that, that's kind of outside of Canada. But based on what we know today, when we look at Canada, I don't see a recession nationally. I think that there's a very good chance that you'll see Ontario slip into a technical recession. So for your listeners, technical recession or recession is when GDP growth goes to negative territory for two consecutive quarters. Now, we're not there. We are not even close to there, to be honest with you. We see the trend coming down, but ultimately we see growth in the in Alberta, as an example, Saskatchewan, even BC, East Coast, positive GDP. Ontario is kind of slipping into that negative GDP territory. That's a forecast, by the way. So the point is, is that Canada could pull this off. I think we have to look at it on an ongoing basis, which is what we do. Uh, but as I'm looking today, uh, I don't see Canada with a hard landing today anyways. Part of my my fears is actually for what I would call the regular household or the regular regular Canadians. It's definitely in Ontario, those who leverage themselves highly and stuck with variable rates and they've watched as... And they held on to them and watched as their monthly payments have gone astronomical. Mm. And a lot of people don't realize, for anyone who's lived through the 80s and watched when interest rates went from, say, 10% to 20%, they doubled. What people don't realize is that interest rates uh, have gone so much higher because at one point we were so much lower and we've we've quadrupled, uh, mm. I believe, at, at this point. So for and, and with much higher debt loads and the, the law of large numbers really kicks in it and, it can, and it really strips away people's abilities. So not only are they seeing their fuel costs go up, not only are they seeing their food costs go up, they're seeing their mortgage costs go up yeah. and it's it becomes this balancing act. And I'm watching it as a private lender. I'm watching it on this side of the fence and seeing as people are really being set up to, to lose. And, mm. and have to sell their properties. And, and so on one side, that creates a huge opportunity for people that are going to try to go in and get real estate at reasonable prices, you know, and perhaps even be able to solve a lot of these problems for people that need to, yeah. to get out of them. And, and I do appreciate that. I also do feel for those people that are in those situations are and are going to be losing homes. And I think there's something really important for people to realize and try to give themselves runways. We're runway. We're watching businesses lay off employees and increase their their runway for for their for their uh, company's burn rates. And you're a business owner, so you know the importance of that. And I'm not watching as the Canadian household is really taking that into account. Hey, let's get rid of some liability so that we can weather this storm. So what I really want to ask out of that is, because I know this is of great importance to you, it is not just authenticity, but leadership. And obviously we're in leadership to wealth and, and wealth comes after the leadership. And so what is it about personal leadership and being a leader for others that really lights you up? Well, I think there's just some opportunity to, you know, I've made, you know, you talk about, um, I've been on the earth long enough to have made a lot of mistakes. And, you know, what I come to understand for myself is that what lights me up is being of service, of supporting others. You know, I gain my significance and my fulfillment through supporting others in their success. And I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I've made a lot of investments mistakes and financial mistakes and business mistakes. And that just becomes part of it. You know, you start to 
realize that peer, people have this fear of failure, but understanding the one fundamental factor is that you've got to fail in order to grow. You have to be uncomfortable in order to uh, gain strength. And, you know, we use the analogy of going to the gym. You don't get stronger by lifting light weights. You have to push your limit. You have to add an extra couple of pounds in order to grow the strength. And in part of, you know, investing and part of, uh, you know, growing a business, you're going to make some mistakes and it's going to be costly. But if you don't take those chances, you don't really ever learn along the way. You always risk mitigate. So for me, when it comes to leadership, it's being able to share some of my, you know, old guy wisdom, if you will, and be, have been a coach for now for almost 25 years and working with investors. I've learned a lot from people. I've learned the psychology. I've learned language, the narrative that's used, the words that are chosen. It really gives me insights into somebody. So I'm able to kind of enter the conversation where they are. That's a fundamental of understanding and leading and being a great leader is entering the conversation where people are at and then bringing them up to a level that you can converse with them differently. If I start coming in to a conversation like this and start you know, talking about all the things I know and all of the complexities of real estate like you do with private, with private lending, you lose people. They don't understand. That's not leadership. Leadership is entering the conversation where they are, first yeah. discovering where it is, and then bringing them up. And then starting to you know, share the lessons you've learned along the way so that people don't have to make those same mistakes. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I hope. Hey, it, it it got us into it. And it's interesting because I've, I've been at different uh, events and uh, real estate events. And it amazes me as I'll see someone, a speaker, someone that's going to teach something and they'll get up there and they'll immediately start selling something. They'll start talking about this or that. And, and it, it occurs to me that you, you don't know what's important to the people in front of you. You, mm -hmm. you haven't taken the time to figure out what is, what is it that's important to them that they want to hear before you start going into talking about this stuff. And, and it really shows the difference between perhaps someone that's interested in someone else's well-being versus, um, versus their own. And, I'm asking this question because uh, if you could sort of share with us the other side, how do people identify those mentors, those leaders that that they should be uh, going after and going, hey, I want to get the confidence from someone else that's gone ahead of me that's perhaps mm -hmm. made more mistakes. How do I learn to identify what that leader looks like? Because I think our idea of leadership is even skewed in uh, modern day because we we're inundated by social media and watching everyone with Ferraris and Lamborghinis and all these kind of things and nice suits. And we can show you how to make in 30 days. Mm. And people have sort of lost some touch with what a mentor or leader should look like. I think there's a fundamental, right? Which is, you know, uh, I think it was Munger that said, you know, greed isn't what drives people. It isn't greed that, you know, drives the need to take on more debt or to do all these things. It's actually envy. And when we start to understand that the psychology of people, especially, I, I don't want to say especially, we see it more today because of social media, Instagram, those, you know, those moments in time where, holy cow. And then, you know, the guy with the Lamborghini that nobody realizes that he rented that Lambo for an hour to take the pictures or he actually snuck onto a lot of some sort. I mean, the point is, is that it's envy that drives decisions, which is driven by emotionality. And the most difficult thing to do is make a non-emotional decision when it comes to how do you, who do you get involved with? So, you know, within, within the Everyday Millionaire uh, podcast, I also do a segment called Mindset Matters with my wife, Stephanie, who's an Olympic mental performance coach. And in the Mindset Matters, we often talk about, and in my coaching, I talk about values. So is it a values-driven decision? So, for example, I've had uh, guests on my show because, you know, their publicist has called me or somebody I look at their bio and it looks really great and they look really interesting. And, and I talk to them and I actually go through the interview process with them and then go, 
no, I don't want to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to publish this particular podcast. Now it's rare, but the point is, is that they don't align with my values or they don't align with the values of the everyday millionaire. They don't, my picture of the everyday millionaire, and they don't align with the values of the real estate investment network. When you start making values driven decisions, it changes the way you make decisions. And so if you're looking for that mentor, that leader, that, you know, somebody, number one, do they have a track record? Have you observed them? Have you looked and listened to their narrative? Are they talking about get rich quick? Or are they talking about the realities of, yes, there is a way it's hard work. You know, that's because that's just the truth. I get bullshit and say, well, you'll make a hundred grand this year. That's possible for sure. You know, that it's all possible, but then we look into the world of possibilities and probabilities and you go, no, that's hard work. That's even harder work. So the point is, is do you align with the values of that individual because they're, they're, they are telling the truth and that you align with them in that, yeah, that makes sense for me, that lands for me? Or are you buying into the, the FOMO, the hype, the urgency because, oh my gosh, this deal is never going to be there again? You know, of course, as you know, uh, when it comes to real estate, you're going to miss a deal and then you go, oh my gosh, but just realize that there'll be another deal always, probably sooner than you think. <laughs> yes. Although we still kick ourselves every oh, time yeah. we miss a deal. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> and then we're like, whew, good thing I didn't uh, do that one, you know, yeah. and, uh, and there's always some element of that. And you, you were right earlier when you talked about, you know, to some degree that fear doesn't go away. And I actually consider it as a servant. It serves me to to have a little bit of that because it always makes me look back at the numbers uh, to make sure, is this actually true? Is this, you know, or are you buying into the hype? Sometimes people start to expect that you're just going to be able to produce the next thing and you don't ever want to buy into your own hype. So, but with regards to what you were saying in terms of leadership and, and mentorship, looking for someone that is, uh, you know, that's values based is really powerful because anyone can tell you how to make the next the, the next set of uh you know get rich quick schemes and we've always seen it i've been dealing with some people actually even at west um there was some fallout there from some of these real estate networks that um were not that reputable but mm -hmm. but i do want to ask sort of this question around uh, as people are uh, you, you know they're they're trying to understand what motivates can you speak a little bit about uh, further i know you you got grandkids and what is what is it for you that that makes you want to be a co contribution for people to want to be a support to people and and so that people can kind of get that essence of what that looks like and what someone who's been in service for uh, more than two decades what that looks like so that they're they they get a better taste and feel of it. Can you speak a little bit more there? Well, I think, you know, I don't know that I'm all that rare in terms of my thought process around it, but there is a, you know, I've done lots of research. I've worked with lots of coaches over the years, you know, personally, uh, there are people that I follow. There is actually, you know, a human need to uh, have significance. There is a human need to be a contribution. One of the reasons that, you know, one of the reasons, not the reason, but one of the reasons that we have family is that we're being a contribution to the planet. You know, we're populating the earth, we're carrying on with our legacy. But ultimately the contribution part of it is really that moment in time where you get to say, you know, I was part of somebody's journey for them to live into their vision. You know, we have this, you know, there's all sorts of I, on my podcast, I rarely ask the question of how do you define success? Because everybody's got a different definition of it. I felt compelled one day with a particular guest and he gave me a great a great definition for success, which was that when you're living your vision, you are, in fact, successful. If you have a vision, if you have a mission and you're living it, guess what? What more do you want? And, it, it, you know, money may be a benchmark. It may be a milestone. It may be a target. But that doesn't define your success because does that money support you in having a great life and being healthy? Uh, is it really serving you in a, a more profound way or is it just that I've got a million dollars in my bank account or whatever your number is? So all of that is to say that, you know, for me, understanding my values, uh, that's a genetic predisposition, perhaps uh, understanding myself, what lights me up in terms of uh, 
how I feel about my life and about my own vision. And my wife is the same. And that's why we probably came, one of the reasons we came together. And then ultimately being that contribution is that level of significance that we as humans need that level. So if you don't identify that, if it's always about you, and certainly there are those narcissists out there, but you know, I think people will, when people, if you bring people's awareness to what really lights them up, yes, there's some money there. Yes, there's a great job there. But even in that, what's it connected to? And often, if you really dig deep and you go through the layers and help people in that discovery, it always comes to being of service to others. And that, you know, and if they can make their living being of service to others, that's even better. You know, we, of course, it's cliche these days, but you know, when your vocation is like your vacation, you'll never work another day in your life. You know, and both my wife and I, we joke about it. We're on the Freedom 95 program because we'll never, ever stop doing some version of what we're doing. It may expand. Yeah. It may not look like the Real Estate Investment Network, but it'll always be some version of what we're doing in terms of uh, supporting others in their growth. And that's just how we're wired. And we know that. And we're really good at it. Is that one of the things you enjoy about the podcast? Oh, of course. You know, it's getting that message out there. It is really... Um, and being and, and, and of developing the skill of interview and the skill of digging deep and listening and understanding that, you know, I've got some great guests and they bring great message. And how can I get that message out there? I've got a great team of people that support me. I don't do it by myself, you know. Yeah. But as I said to you before the podcast, or maybe I said to Wyatt, I don't know. But at the end of the day, I'm way more comfortable behind the mic than I am in front of the mic. But, uh, you know, I go in front of the mic occasionally because I also need the practice. I love what you're saying, because one of the things that's important to me when when I talk to people that are interested in in being private lenders and investing, doing this this kind of stuff, I always have two rules for them. One is if you're not sure about this uh making money in this real estate thing, you know, come back to me when, when you are sure that there's money in it. And then the other one is about giving back because one of the things that you learn very quickly in business, in investing is that the money is just a benchmark. And if there isn't something else there for you, it's not for me, I realize it's not necessarily someone that I'm going to want to be around. And because I plan on doing this for, Till the day I die, being around people and and helping them build, mm -hmm. you want to be around people that understand that that uh, the importance of being in contribution because see, that's see, where this, it really comes in. Yeah, and this goes back to even the brief conversation we had about values. You know, mm -hmm. seeking leaders with values. So understanding that one of my core values is being of support of others. Not everybody yeah. has that core value, by the way, and, and that's fine. But you attract like-minded people yeah. when you are clear on your values. So to your point, you're asking a great question. You know, is a being of service to others really important to you? I've been on, I'll give you an example. I've been on massage therapists' tables and understanding that one is a massage therapist as a thing to do, to make money. And then there are the massage therapists that are truly committed to your wellness. And yes, you're paying them for it, but their commitment to your wellness is yeah. very evident in their passion and their commitment to making sure that you have the best experience and get the best massage that they can possibly give. It's a totally different experience and you may have had that, but ultimately when you're in that service industry, then you better be committed to that experience for others. If that, if that doesn't light you up, it's going to get tired really fast, which yeah. is a great why you asking that question of anybody who wants to get into it. That's a great question to ask because it really starts to shine a light. They got to hold a mirror up and go, am I, is that who I am? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you can't enjoy the journey, if you, if you can't enjoy today, then you know, you'll, we may never make it to that other point. You won't be happy if you're, if you're not going to be happy until you get to that point, then you're never going to be happy because hundred percent, right. That, that just doesn't happen. And so you have to be able to be, as you said, be lit up about what you're doing and who you're being each and every day, knowing that you're maybe taking on your fears and, and also being a support to others and bringing people along with you. My wife and I just went to uh Dominican ending of last year and there were people that were like, Oh, I'm living the best life ever. And, and I'm thinking this, 
<laughs> this is your best life. I, I'm happy for you, but at the same time, I'm thinking, my I'm enjoying myself. But man, I wish that some of the people that I get to have conversations with on a daily basis, I wish they could be here. Mm. And it re and it reminded me of something that one of my friends said to me when COVID happened. He he went down to Barbados, and he said he took his family. He went there. He said, "Hey, I wish you were here." because I'm kind of here by myself mm. and you realize that if you don't bring people along with you, you may be on the beaches in the world, but you'll be there by yourself. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, I think one of the important things, and, and I think this is important because you foster it in the rain network is bringing people alongside you because we're really built to be in community and and when we come along as a community then we really thrive together and and uh enjoy life along the way mm -hmm. so just to end this off here i i know we've come time and you've got uh you've got a lot of other things to do um what's what's next for you with the podcast and what's next for rain well, with Rain, what we're doing is we're actually getting into some public events again, you know, smaller, more intimate events, uh, way smaller groups. You know, the yeah. you know, the big 500 people in a room, we're not interested in it anymore. Yeah. Uh, we think we can do and deliver more to smaller groups. And so we've got some really cool plans that we're that literally are starting to roll out uh, in 2023, early 2023. Uh, we'll start to see and people start hearing about that, uh, I think, in March. Uh, we did a, a kind of a, a really cool event called the Think Tank. And it was literally a small 15 person event that was kind of I don't want to call it a mastermind, but it was with next level of uh, business owners and real estate investors. So we're doing some of that work. That's all kind of plays into the ethos of who we are and who we want to be and how we want to continue. You know, from the podcast point of view, both the Everyday Millionaire and the Mindset Matters and rain we're we're into the youtube world we've launched our youtube channels and and you know are going to go through the the grind of growing those channels it's hard work and uh it takes time but we're committed to doing that and getting that message out there even more and uh yeah so that's kind of some of the focus that i've got for 2023 we've got some things going on on a business scope that we, we hope to scale with a couple of uh, strategic partners so yeah some cool things going on Love it. Love it. Where's the best place if people want to get a hold of you? Where's the best place for them to chase you down? I have a very specific uh, public email that I share. I have no problem sharing it. And that is CEO at raincanada.com. And that's CEO at R-E-I-N Canada.com. I answer all those emails. And uh, that's a, the easiest way to get a hold of me directly. Or if you want to just know more about Rain, you go to raincanada.com. Yeah. And, and make sure you, we'll have all of these links in the show notes, guys. Please make sure you check out his podcast. And I can't speak enough to the value that you can get out of the RAIN network and uh, for, for really getting yourself around like-minded people. Uh, you know, Patrick, thank you so much for coming on today, for sharing your, your commitment to people and to their financial futures. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me join you. I've enjoyed it much.